Thanks for coming out this evening. We have a great program for you. Um, the, the choir is going to do a very special um, uh, performance for you. It's um, very topic oriented. Tonight's topic is about winter blues, depression. Um, we're going to hear a lot of information about um, thoughts of hurting yourself or others and those, those kind of depressive thoughts. Um, I just want you, I want to emphasize and not to not to be a complete Debbie Downer, but I want to emphasize how, um, how important and how widespread this topic and this, um, um, the things that we're facing in the school districts, in districts across the state, um, how, how big this has come. So big, in fact, that our governor earmarked $650 million to school districts to address issues such as social emotional, mental health, physical health in the schools. Um, the money that the school district has, has received, we are um, increasing our liaison services. We are, um, with that money, we are putting together, together, we're hiring a mental health coordinator to facilitate all of these services and programs and um, trainings and information within the district. It has gotten to be such a huge um, concern across the state in Columbus with our legislature, with our leaders in Columbus that they have put forth so much money. This is not something that we are, um, that in our small community that we are immune to. Um, when we when we talk to our school liaisons, when we sit around our table with our guidance counselors, our liaisons, our principals, and we hear about young people in grades four, five, and six who have really, they struggle with some really dark thoughts um, that go through their head. It, it just, it, it breaks our heart, but it is also something that we as a school district, as a community, um, we need to address, and that's what we're doing tonight. So I appreciate all of you being here. Um, and I am going to turn the mic over to Ms. Rachel Kelly, and I'm gonna let her talk about the performance. So our performance today is by the High School, the High School Symphonic Advanced Choir. Um, while I am talking, they are actually going to stand up and go up here. Our piece today is entitled Please Stay by Jake Greenstad, and it features um, a soloist, uh, our senior bass, Katie Beachler. I'm going to be here at the end. I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to kind of read what the composer says about the piece. I'm going to use my phone so I don't mess up any of the facts. To Write Love on Her Arms is a nonprofit movement dedicated to presenting hope and finding help for people struggling with depression, addiction, self-injury, and suicide. Their 2016 campaign for World Suicide Prevention Day was titled, And So I Kept Living. Using the hashtag, I Kept Living, thousands of individuals who battle depression shared their stories on Twitter as to why they chose life over death. Jake Grunstad, our composer, read through and collected hundreds of the tweets and used them to inspire the text for this work you will hear. Please Stay is an anthem for hope, an attempt to destigmatize mental illness and challenge all of us to support those who are battling depression and thoughts of suicide. You are not alone. We can make a difference, and we can be the support system that saves a life. No, don't go, don't go. 
So yeah, well, thanks for uh, thanks for being here, and it was great to hear the the high school choir. They did a great job. That song was very powerful, and a lot of the things that they uh, communicated through the through the music is exactly what we as adults and as people who care for others need to be thinking about as we live with people or know people or rub shoulders with people who have who are experiencing depression or who are experiencing even thoughts of self-harm. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, I'm Jerry Strauss, but I do work at Appleseed Mental Health Center. Uh, I'm the director there. I've worked there for uh, 20 years, which is hard to believe, but I have. I'm not that old, but I, I have worked there for 20 years. And one of my great co-workers is, is Amy Morgan, and she and I are going to, uh, she's a counselor at Appleseed, and we are going to uh, present uh, tonight some information about depression, and about uh, how depression and suicide are, inter are related to each other, um, correlate with each other. And then Amy's going to uh, talk about how we as uh, citizens, everyday people, can support, encourage, and intervene with someone who's having suicidal thoughts or uh, wanting to, to harm themselves. And so I'm going to start by talking about uh, depression. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is and um, why it's important that we understand uh, what it is and what it can do and what it means for someone to have to be experiencing depression. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do to uh, help ourselves or help someone else who might be experiencing depression. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the correlation between depression and suicide. And then Amy's going to uh, finish up by uh, doing a presentation that we acronym is QPR, which stands for Question, Persuade, and Refer, which is how we um, help someone else who may be having suicidal thoughts. So, we get started, and I don't know what to do to keep that from squeaking, but... You point it towards the speaker. It's all right. Oh, stay. I'll try to face the front here. So, yeah. Let's see. So, let's, uh, let's think about why... Why do we need to talk about depression? You know, first of all, what is it? You know, uh, we all go through times in life when we feel sad, right? And I mean, being sad is, is part of life. We go through something that's, that's hurtful, harmful. Um, we lose something or someone, we're going to be sad, and that's perfectly normal. So being sad occasionally or as part of life isn't exactly what I'm talking about when I say depression. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more uh, when I say depression. What exactly do I mean by that? And what are we talking about when we say depression? Uh, why is it important that we know something about it? 
and then what can we do about it? So let me first of all say, uh, what, what are we talking about when we say depression? Now up here, what you see are what we who work in the mental health world would call the symptoms of a major depressive episode. Now there are various types of uh, what we would call diagnosable types of depression, but they all, they all mean something to do with these symptoms up here. So when we're talking about depression, it's more than sadness. It does involve being sad or depressed, down, discouraged, blue. Um, it, it does involve that. But it also goes much deeper than that. When we're talking about someone who is really, truly in a depressed state, not only are they sad, but they also really, really struggle to just feel happy about anything. In fact, one of the hallmarks of someone who's really depressed is things that used to really make them happy, that they enjoyed doing, maybe they had a hobby or uh, they liked to go out with people, that no longer does anything for them. They just can't feel happy and they just can't experience pleasure. Their body just won't let them do that. Um, a person who's really, truly depressed also often struggles with appetite. Now, it can go uh, one of two ways. You might uh, eat a lot more and gain weight, or you might not be able to eat at all and lose your appetite and lose a lot of weight. You see people who are experiencing depression sort of go either way with that. Um, and you, it just depends on the person, their personality, their body makeup, or how much pressure and stress. I mean, we're all like stress eating, right? I'm, I stress eat carbs, sugar, caffeine, yes. But I know I can also get to a point where I'm, where I'm really, really, really taxed and I just, nothing tastes good or sounds good. And so it, it just really depends on who you are and, and what you're experiencing. But that is part of when your body gets depressed, when you are in that, uh, starting down that black hole of depression. Another important thing to realize about depression and what does it mean to be depressed is sleep. People who are experiencing depression either sleep a lot, just want to stay in bed, don't want to get out of bed, or they really can't sleep. They may go to bed but they, and they may not be able to fall asleep or they may wake up and not be able to go back to sleep, but there's, there's a... Um, a disruption of your sleep somehow of your normal sleep cycle when you're depressed. Another part of depression is just being really, really fatigued, no energy. You just don't want to do anything. That's why, you know, sometimes if you go to the home of someone who's really, really depressed, their house is kind of messy because they just don't have the energy to do the dishes. They don't have the energy to run the vacuum cleaner. They don't have the energy to pick up after themselves. Just a general sense of fatigue. In fact, to the point where they can let themselves go. They can just be so tired, they just don't have the energy to take a shower. They don't have the energy to, to take care of themselves. That's also part of being depressed. Uh, so just, uh, you might see an increase in, in, in pur purposeless activity, hand-wringing, pacing, uh, or... So you might see them be just be, you know, kind of look worried or just uh, doing things that uh, aren't helpful, but just wringing their hands and pacing. Or you might see them just not be able to do anything. They're just slow. Everything's going much slower. Um, a big part of depression uh, is feeling worthless and guilty. So often people who are going down the road of major depression have a sense of worthlessness. So you wonder why, you know, you can't talk them out of it, you can't perk them up, you can't encourage them to, uh, to feel better, or they have this unrealistic sense of guilt. Maybe they feel guilty, and we'll talk about the cycle of depression, but maybe they feel guilty because the dishes are piling up, I'm not doing the dishes, I feel guilty about doing the dishes, but the guilt is making me more depressed so I don't do the dishes. Um, you can get into that cycle, so to speak. Difficulty concentrating and thinking is another part of depression. 
you know, all, all your body systems are sort of just slowing down and not working right when you're depressed. You're just not yourself, body, mind, and spirit. And all those things then can lead to thoughts about death, worrying about death, thinking about death, or thinking about your own particular death. Uh, you know, uh, so depression and mental health symptoms or diagnoses is one of the primary risk factors of a person who's having suicidal thinking or suicidal thoughts. Um, prior, a prior history might be the, um, the greatest risk, but, but a close second is depression and mental health kinds of things. And, and another important thing to remember when we're talking about someone who's depressed, it, it's not just, I feel bad today. Like We all can have a couple bad days, right? Normal. But when it goes on for two weeks or more, and they're just not getting out of this funk. They're just, you're seeing those, several of those, you may not see all of them, but you're seeing several of those things, then you know, okay, this person is, is really going down the path of more of a serious, depressed condition. So why is it important that we talk about it? That's what it is, okay, that's what depression is. Why is it important that we talk about it? Well, it's important because it affects our relationships, it affects work and our ability to do things that we care about, that matter, that, that um, you know, the things we're designed to do, our, our work, our jobs, uh, whether those are jobs we do at home or jobs we do out in the community. Uh, and it has a big impact on health as well. Uh, people who have depression are much more likely to not be healthy in other ways. Um, the number of, uh, so the number of people attempting to harm themselves, it's also important because the number of people attempting to harm themselves is increasing. I don't know if you had heard that. I know there was some news about that a few months ago, but the, um, the rate of people attempting and completing self-harm, suicide, dying by suicide, has been going up over the last decade. In fact, it's up 33% since 1999. Now, I always ask myself when I hear that, you know, here we are in an in a, in a age of great technology, right? Great technology, great ability to communicate through electronics and, um, you know, stay in touch with social media or um, we have a lot of great technology, a lot of knowledge. Something's broken, right? Because the suicide uh, the suicide statistics are 33% higher now than they were in 1999. If you look at the suicide uh, statistics for young, young people, age 10 to 24, it's up 56%. 56%. That's remarkable. That is remarkable if you think about a decade. 56% increase. So this is why it's important for us to know about this, to talk about it, and make it, and make it a, a, something that we as a community we're aware of. So just some things to think about. Um, did I, let me see if I missed something. I feel like I skipped over something. I might have been. So yeah, let me pick up these couple just key pieces of information before I go back to depression and work. Um, I want to show you a kind of a broad general perspective from two two sort of segments of healthcare. One is Blue Cross. So that's, their statistics are on insured Americans. So people who are working, people who are out there, uh, in, you know, uh, engaged in life. Um, they say that the diagnosis of depression uh, in the United States uh, is about 4.4%. But they, they also reiterate that it's, that it's increasing. Uh, the rates are rising faster among millennials, 47% increase. Adolescents, 47% increase. And a 65% increase for girls. That's pretty remarkable. Of the, now, they're talking about the insured population. So that's the working middle class, upper middle class families. Women uh, typically are diagnosed with major depression at higher rates than men. Um, 
People diagnosed with major depression are 30% uh, less healthy on average. Um, 85% of people who are diagnosed with major depression also have one or more additional serious chronic health conditions. And they, I think they kind of go uh, hand in hand. You might be depressed because of some of your health conditions, but also depression can lead to lifestyle patterns that might increase your chance of having health problems. And then just general statistics from the National Center for Health. Um, they would say that eight, in general, 8% of the population at any given time is depressed. Women are higher than men. And um, of those adults with a depression, they talk about difficulty at work, at home, and in social activities. So when I say these things, it's, it's really the information is coming out of um, health care. It's, it's stuff that doctors and nurses and healthcare systems are seeing in their diagnosis uh, across the board in the larger population. So how does, how does depression affect people at work? Okay, if you're, 50% of people uh, say that if, you know, depression affects me at work, I, I don't work as well. 30% uh, of adults with depression say that uh, they've had moderate or extreme difficulty at work. So depression is important to know about because if you're depressed or you know someone who's depressed, there's a real chance they're not able to go out and do the things that they would normally do. Um, what about depression and health? Uh, this is information again from Blue Cross Blue Shield, so healthcare information. But this last uh, paragraph here, life expectancy for someone who is experiencing depression is about 10 years less. Isn't that remarkable? So you think about a person who's struggling with chronic, that black hole of depression. You know, uh, people who have severe mental illness have a lifespan of about 20 years less than the average person. If it's depression, it's about 10 years less. So there may be a lot of reasons for that. Maybe it's uh, maybe the somebody who's not healthy is depressed because they're not healthy, or maybe you are depressed and you're not then practicing healthy lifestyle choices. You're you know you're not getting enough sleep. You're not eating well. You're using um, unhealthy coping skills, and that then uh, maybe cuts your life short. So knowing about depression, as you can see, uh, is important because it affects how we work. It affects how our health is. And then I think also very importantly, depression affects relationships. Why, why does depression affect relationships? Well, think about that list of what constitutes major depression or, or a depressive episode. Uh, if you're tired a lot and you just don't have the energy to get off the couch or to get out of bed or to clean up after yourself or to take a shower, isn't that going to affect your relationship with your family and the people you live with? Absolutely. They may get frustrated because it doesn't seem like you're able to do what they think you should be doing. Come on, let's go. You'll feel better. And it just doesn't happen because you're locked into this uh, kind of this black hole of depression. Same with feelings of guilt. If you feel guilty all the time or that sense of worthlessness, it's going to, be, it's going to affect your relationships. You're, you're, again, it, it kind of draws out your energy keeps you from doing things that you, you do that you enjoy. Feeling hopeless, maybe you're in a relationship with your family, your wife, your husband, your kids, and, and you're just this morbid sadness and you don't see any hope, any future. It's difficult to be with that person, maybe. Maybe that's why it affects relationships. Um, you know, think about the lack of ability to experience pleasure, which is a key component of depression. You just can't have fun. Well, that's going to affect relationships, right? That's going to make it difficult. And then lack of motivation to do things, to mow the grass, go to work, clean up the house, clean up yourself. All those things are going to affect the relationships that you're in. So when we talk about depression, we're not just talking about a sad mood here. We're talking about a deep-seated sort of black hole that affects a person's entire life, their health, their ability to work and contribute to the community, and their ability to be in a healthy relationship. So it's very important that we as a community understand that. I think sometimes we think of depression and, it's, and we get frustrated with people or we, we don't understand what they're going through. But um, 
a good friend of mine in Ashland who works at a local um, local, local agency. Uh, he's a um, works with a lot of different people, but he would say he'd, he would rather work with and support and encourage somebody who had a health like a physical health problem than depression because depression just is so difficult to overcome and makes a person not want to do anything else. So let's let's stop here. We've kind of got an understanding of what depression is, um, how it affects people, how it affects families, how it affects others. Are there any questions so far from anybody in the in the audience? I can answer it or Amy can answer it. If I can't answer it, I'm sure Amy can answer it. Any questions about depression? You might want to save it for later, but do you have any premises on what's happened in the last 10 or 20 years? Why why people are more depressed? Yeah. I I think that I would I would boil it down to this. I why are we why are we in in our community? Because we could talk about anxiety as well. You know, depression I think of simply as uh, kind of, uh, you're stuck. In, you're worried about the past, whereas anxiety is you're more worried about the future. That's kind of a simple oversimplification. But there's more depression and there's more anxiety in our community. There's more drug and alcohol abuse, and there's more suicide. Why is that? I think that if you had to to identify one common core cause, it would be broken relationships. I mean, from what I understand from our superintendent, 20% of students in Loudonville School District are being raised by their grandparents. Why is that? Broken relationships. Um, so I think that that's probably, I think there's a huge, there's a, there's a really strong correlation between the amount of time you spend on social media and depression. In other words, the more time you're on social media, the more, the more likely you are to be clinically depressed. So I think we're, even though we have more opportunities, it feels like for socialization, we're more disconnected from people than ever before. Yeah. Not on the suicide, but depression and the anxiety, do you think that it might not be as big of an increase? Maybe we just now have better diagnostic and treatment? Mm-hmm. So right. I, that, that, is, that is something that you do read in the literature. Um, so that's a possibility. It feels to me, though, like just from working at, at an agency that works with people who are having mental health issues, it feels like it feels more intense. Would you say that that's true? I know that, like, in the eight years that I've been at Appleseed, our case management, and, like, our case management cases just in and of itself has doubled. So the amount of children receiving services um, has increased right. enough that we've had to increase our staff by 50% on the kids' side. Yeah. I, I would say that, so I would say yes, there's probably some of that, but I would also say anecdotally that there is an erosion of coping skills across our country, an erosion of coping skills. And I think it goes back to broken relationships, ultimately. So... Now, what causes depression? Well, there's a lot of different reasons people might have those symptoms of a clinical depressive episode. It's not all one thing. And there's not one solution. Uh, Certainly, and we've, uh, in this community, talked a lot about adverse childhood experiences. If you, as a young person, uh, experience any kind of abuse, you know, physical, mental, sexual abuse, um, abandonment, neglect, a broken family, domestic violence, uh, any of those kinds of things. There's something that's happened inside of you, most likely, that I think is going to predispose you towards being, to, to having some depression, unless you are able to develop good coping skills. So that's one possibility. Relationship issues. Uh, broken relationships, struggling relationships, no, not good relationships, loneliness, that's certainly something that can cause a person to be depressed. Personality factors, I don't want to discount. There's a lot of bad things that are happening, but sometimes people are just more uh, pessimistic and negative. 
So I'm trying to, I'll stay on track here. So, um, so I, have a, I have a person in my family who overanalyzes everything. So you can tell them a great, happy story, and they're already thinking about, well, you know, what's the negative side of that? It's just how they are. That's their personality. And they are definitely tend to be more uh, sad, you know, discouraged. So sometimes it's personality factors. And you can recognize that in yourself, and you can learn to train yourself to try to, to think a little differently. But, but sometimes it's just by nature, your personality tends to be a little bit more geared towards being depressed. Um, sometimes it's a buildup of stress. You know, if you don't have coping skills to equal the amount of stress in your life, you are going to, you're going to have an, you know, an overload of toxic stress hormones in your body, and you're quite frankly or quite possibly going to experience depression. Medica there's medications that people are on that cause depression. You should always read the side effects. Um, there's a lot of medications that might have a side effect of depression. So always make sure you know the side effects of the medications that you're taking. Um, if you think about the cycle of depression, so here's what happens a lot of times to people. You, you, you are experiencing depression, and so what does that mean? I don't have any energy. I don't do the things I used to do that I enjoyed doing. I don't, I don't do as much. So then I feel more guilty and hopeless and ineffective, and that makes me more depressed. It's a, it is a cycle that people get in. So how do you change that? What do you do to impact and reverse and recover from depression? So the good news is, here's the good news, depression is very, very treatable. It's very, very overcomable. But it does take you to, takes, requires you to do something, requires you to do something different. So um, if you think about depression, it's just, it's, 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 a black hole, it's not, it's not energy, it's sitting in the chair. If you want to start to uh, get better from depression, then you have to start pushing into that. In other words, you have to start taking some steps and doing things that initially may not feel comfortable even doing because you are depressed. Um, so, increasing your activity level. And I'll tell you, I, for about five years in my uh, early part of my time as a counselor, I worked at a psychiatric hospital. And I worked a lot with older adults, actually. And uh, one of the things about depression is if you, you can get so depressed that you become psychotic. In other words, you, you, know, you start to hear voices or you believe things that aren't true. And so uh, <clears throat> I remember having this one person I was working with that was morbidly depressed Obviously, they were in a psychiatric hospital. And so we, we made this strategy. One of the things that, that they struggled with was that they didn't do any housework. Their dishes were piled high. They looked at that pile of dishes. I can't do these dishes. It made them more depressed. So we made a plan. You're going to wash two spoons a day. Two spoons a day. And you're going to walk to your mailbox. That's a, just do that. Don't do any more than that. Well, lo and behold, what happened? They did two spoons, and they thought, oh, I can do a couple more spoons. They did a couple more spoons. You know, over the course of a few days, they got that pile of dishes washed. They were walking to their mailbox, and they were walking on further. And slowly, over time, they got better. People who are depressed and don't want to eat, well, you can't, you know, they don't sit down in front of a meal, but they can eat little snacks, healthy snacks. So have a, you know, some cheese or some lunch meat or some fruit sitting out so you can just eat periodically. You've got to start moving. You've got to start moving. That's one of the keys, I believe, to overcoming depression is start moving. Um, because once you start moving, all of a sudden you realize, okay, I can, this, I'm making progress here. One of the other best ways to overcome depression is schedule your entire day. Schedule your entire day with what you're going to do. So 8 o'clock in the morning, let's just say I'm going to get up. 8.15, I'm going to take a shower. 8.45, I'm going to make my bed. 9 o'clock, I'm going to watch the news. 9.30, I'm going to eat breakfast. 10 o'clock, I'm going to call my friend. And what happens is as you go through your list, even though there are things that just you would do anyway, you're checking off the list. And lo and behold, there's some inertia there. And the next thing you know, you can look at your list at noon, 
and you've got a whole half a page of things done. Well, that, that gives you energy. That adds energy to you. To feel like you've accomplished something, it makes me feel better when I accomplish something. It just adds energy to you. So scheduling your day and moving forward into it is one of the key ways to overcoming depression. Uh, that's one component of overcoming depression, um, for sure. So, overcoming depression. Now, this I saw this actually out on the table out there. This is something that um, you can find on the SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health website. It's uh, the wellness wheel. So, when I say overcoming depression, is depression is very treatable. It's it's very doable. When you are depressed and if you don't have a lot of support, it may feel like you can't overcome it, but you can. And uh, like so many things, it just takes you stepping out and into several areas of your life. Your emotional side. Can you talk to someone? Can you talk to a friend? Can you have a support group around you? Spiritually, can you engage your creative side? Can you uh, read some motivational, spiritual material? Can you read a book? Can you read a chapter out of a book? Can you take a walk down the street, even if it's just, uh, you know, 100 yards or 100 feet, for that matter? Uh, can you start to clean up one corner of your house? Just do one corner. That's a mess. Just clean up one corner. Can you, uh, you know, put some money away in a little bank, and then the next thing you know, you look at it, and you've got more money? Can you... Uh, Take a step and go to work. Socially, can you allow, and it's hard sometimes for people who are depressed, but can you re-engage with your friends? So depression, I think there's a tendency sometimes in our society to think, okay, I'm depressed, I need to take medicine for that. Well, antidepressants can help people and they do help people. I don't want to say that you should, you know, I, I want to say that that's important. But that's not enough. You've got to re-engage your whole life with help, hopefully with supports. So, how do you overcome depression? I say it's, first of all, schedule and routine and starting small. Start small. If you know someone who's depressed, don't encourage them to just jump right back into life. Help them start small. Help them with supportive relationships. Don't be judgmental. Be a good listener. Be an encourager. Exercise. I, I say this a lot, and I know people think I'll oh, exercise. I'm, but I will say this, there are multiple studies out there that show that uh, aerobic exercise is as effective as medication on mild to moderate depression. And I think there's a lot of psycho physiological reasons for that. Um, getting enough sleep, having good sleep hygiene is so critical. Uh, eating healthier foods, not just high sugar, high, high, high fast foods. Having a way to process your feelings. Solving problems instead of avoiding problems. And then getting professional help if you can't do those things on your own. Go see a counselor. Go see a psychiatrist. They can help you just get started with something. They can maybe help you plug into a support network so that you can get better. But the big thing is depression is real. It is very debilitating, but it is also very treatable. If you need to start with professional help, Start with professional help, but you're going to eventually begin to work on all these areas of your life to help you um, to have the things going in your body that you need to have so that you feel normal, so that you feel balanced, so that you feel more positive. Any questions about that? I know that seems rather simple for such a horrific thing that I've described, but really that's what it is. It's about everyday coping, everyday coping. So, I have three quick th slides on um, suicide, and then I'm going to let Amy talk. So, one of the things that I think is important for us to realize as we think about suicide is that mental health, mental illness, struggles with, emo with emotional or behavioral health issues is a strong predictor of the potential for suicide. Um, and this is kind of a framework of, of the risk factors for suicide. Um, a mental health condition, uh, the loss of a family member, access to uh, harmful, uh, you know, lethal means, 
relationship problems, previous attempts, a history of abuse, physical uh, disability, losing a friend, or experiencing bullying. Those are all sort of risk factors for depression. They're very similar to the risk factor for suicide. They're very similar to the risk factors for depression, aren't they? Very similar. So how do we overcome that? How do we help someone combat that? It's by helping them develop protective factors. Very similar to what I said about depression. What are the protective factors? Being connected. So for adolescents or children, it's connected to your parents. But connectedness. Remember I said I think the core to all these issues is broken relationships for, for many of the reasons why we're seeing an increase in suicide. Connectedness. Not Facebook connectedness. Okay, I'm talking about sitting down and having a cup of coffee with a friend connectedness. Uh, safety. You know, if you live in a home or a school or a community that's not safe, you're more likely to be depressed and have suicidal thoughts. So safety. Friendship. Building just overall coping skills. Some of the things I talked about. Exercise, diet, sleep, creativity, uh, and access to health services. So these are the kinds of things that as a community, I know Loudonville is Redbird Resilient is really working hard to help Loudonville be a resilient community, right? This is what, it's, this is what it looks like. And this is the last thing I'll say, and then Amy's going to take it from here. Uh, you know, we're talking about not only depression, but we're talking about self-harm. I just want you to know that self-harm is not a, somebody just doesn't wake up one morning and decide, that they want to harm themselves. It is a continuum that starts with, you know, depression or, or those kinds of things. And then you may start to see some risk-taking behaviors. Then they might start to have some thoughts. Then they might start to have some threats. And then they might finally have some kind of gesture or attempt. And then they actually might actually uh, complete or, or something like that. So. I just want to leave you with the idea that depression and suicide are, are connected. And it's not, um, an, typically not, an, it might be a, uh, an act that they do, but it, that seems impulsive, but generally you're going to see a continuum or a progression towards someone who wants to harm themselves. So, any questions before Amy comes up? Good. I will. Cool. Hmm? Okay. For you Good. Want. Thank you. Yeah. So tonight I'm just going to talk a little bit about QPR, which, it, which um, is asking the question to save a life. Um, part of it is that as a community, as humans, it is our responsibility to make sure that um, we're looking out for each other and um, are part of helping everybody um, be safe. So um, you keep going. Yeah. Um, so um, part of this, I mean, it's the Mental Health and Recovery Board supports this, and um, we were trained um, to be able to do this. So it is not intended to be a form of counseling or treatment, um, but it is intended to offer hope through positive action. Um, there's some myths and facts about suicide. One of the myths is that no one can stop a suicide. Um, that it's inevitable, and I think there's this, like, you know, there's nothing I could have done, but if people step up in a crisis and get the help that they need, they will probably never be suicidal again. They might be. This is not like, if they do, if they um, try it, they'll never do it again, but, um, but it's, they probably won't. So um, suicidal people keep their plans to themselves. The fact is most suicidal people will communicate their intent. And a little bit later in this um, presentation, we'll show you some of those risk factors that happen. Um, but, and, and there is, like Jerry said, sometimes it is a very impulsive thing. But if you look back, sometimes you can see some of those risk factors. Um, People who talk about it don't do it, and that's a myth as well. Oftentimes, people are feeling so hopeless, and sometimes they're doing things to help communicate that, but we're just not recognizing it because we don't always know what's going on in somebody's head um, and how deep they are in their depression. Um, there's a myth that once a person decides to complete suicide, there's nothing anyone can do, but the fact is that suicide's the most preventable kind of death, and almost any positive action can save a life. Um, 
Oftentimes, people who are feeling suicidal feel hopeless. So by somebody, somebody coming alongside and saying, here, I'm here, I want to help you, that's just that little bit that they need to know. Like, OK, I'm not by myself. I'm not a burden. Um, I can get the help I need. So um, you're OK. So we're just going to go through some warning signs, um, some clues. The more clues and signs that somebody sees, the higher risk that somebody is um, for actually attempting. So take them, take them seriously. So some direct verbal clues might be if somebody just comes out and says, like, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. I'm planning to kill myself. Um, I'm going to commit suicide. Um, and something that's really common with, with teenagers, which I work with a lot of teenagers, something that's really common is if this doesn't happen, then I'm going to kill myself. Or the reverse, if you don't do what I want you to do or what I'm asking you to do, then I'm going to kill myself. That's really common amongst teenagers. Um, there's some other indirect verbal things where they're not coming right out and saying, I'm going to kill myself, but they might say, I'm tired of living my life. I just can't go on. Um, my family, my friends, everybody would be better off without me. Um, nobody cares if I'm dead anyway. I won't be around much longer. And then sometimes, you know, pretty soon you won't have to worry about me. They're not coming right out and saying, I'm going to kill myself. But they're, they're alluding to the fact that they've had some thoughts that they might not be here or that nobody wants them here. Um, some behavioral clues. So obviously, any previous suicide attempt makes somebody at a lot higher risk um, for trying to attempt suicide. If somebody acquires a gun or stockpiles pills, um, that's a good indication that they might be thinking about doing something, especially if that's out of character. So if it's somebody that wouldn't typically like own a lot of guns or have those things in their home, and then all of a sudden they're like getting a whole bunch of things, that's a, that's a really big red flag. Um, having co-occurring depression, moodiness, hopelessness, um, putting their personal affairs in order. If, if they're trying to get everything ready so that they're not here, so it's going to be taken care of, um, that's a good indicator that, that there's something going on. They start giving things away. Um, having a sudden interest or disinterest in religion. Um, drug or alcohol abuse or relapse after a period of recovery, which is a really big one, because I think sometimes you know, people just feel so defeated that they, they relapsed that that's oftentimes when, when they'll end their lives um, or attempt to. And then unexplained anger, aggression, or irritability. And again, most of these, all of these things are if they're out of character um, is, is when it becomes a warning sign. Um, so situations, being fired or expelled from school, um, especially for kids, if they have to move and leave everything, especially like, you know, teenagers, like their friends are their everything. So sometimes having to move away from all that they know um, can be a risk factor. Um, a loss of a major relationship, death of a loved one, especially if that person dies by suicide. And I think part of that is because we don't talk about it. And so they're living with this knowledge and, and living without this person that they killed themselves and they can't even really talk about it because who wants to talk about suicide? So I think that is, that's a big deal. Um, Diagnosis of a serious or terminal illness. Um, sometimes it's because they don't want to live with it. Sometimes they don't want to put other people through it. Um, sudden expected loss of freedom, fear of punishment, um, anticipated loss of financial security, loss. Um, I think a lot of this is just loss of things that, that they come to know and they have in their lives and then losing it. And then fear of becoming a burden to others. And that's a really big one with people that I talk to is they don't even want to share this stuff because they don't want to give it to anybody else because they love people. They love the people in their lives and they don't want them to feel what they're feeling and they don't want them to worry about them. So they're just going to keep it to themselves, which then perpetuates the depression, which then increases their risk. Um, so. What I think as a community, one of the biggest things that, that we can do is to talk about it and to ask people, if we are seeing several of these signs and we notice it, let's not be afraid to ask. So some tips for asking that question would be, you know, if you really, if you see several things on those um, clues, cues, just ask them, are you thinking about suicide? Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too. But, um, so if in doubt, don't wait. Ask them. If they're reluctant, be persistent. Now, if, you know, within reason, but, you know, they might not have ever shared this with anybody, and so they might not be willing to say, yep, that's what I'm thinking. 
you might have to kind of just be there and be with them in it for a little bit before, um, before they're willing to share. And then talk to them alone or in a private setting. Um, allow the person to talk freely. And again, that's just because maybe this person hasn't really shared this information. And so this is the first that they've really been able to just, you know, kind of put it all out there. Um, so make sure you give yourself plenty of time because you don't want to do it when you're like two seconds from getting ready to walk out the door because if they drop a bomb, you know, you're, you're going to be, you want to be willing to like go through it with them. Um, and have your resources handy. Um, we have, there's um, crisis numbers. I don't know if we brought any of that with us, but we have our crisis line. Um, there's a crisis text line. There are some resources, um, counselor's names. And then how you ask them how they're feeling, or if they're feeling suicidal, is really less important than that you ask the question in the first place. So just some ideas. I mean, everybody has their own, you know, when you're in a relationship with somebody, if you know somebody, you know how to ask ask them questions, but just some ideas. Um, have you been very, have you been unhappy lately? Have you been very unhappy? Um, these are a little bit more less direct. So, or have you been very unhappy lately that you've been thinking about ending your life? Um, and something that's really easy to say is you ever wish you could fall asleep and never wake up again. And I think that's a, that's a kind of more gentle way of saying it. A more direct approach is just simply asking them, are you thinking about killing yourself? And not everybody is comfortable saying that. Um, I do this for, you know, I talk to people as a counselor for a living, and sometimes it's hard for me to say that, so that's completely understandable. Um, but if you can't ask the question, it's really important to find someone that can, because if you're seeing a lot of those risk factors, a lot of those warning signs, there's probably something going on and somebody needs to talk to that person. Um, it's important to kind of not, and this one, we do this a lot in high schools too, and it's important to kind of just say like, you're not suicidal, are you? Because that kind of leads them to believe that maybe you don't really want to know the answer, or that if they do, if they are honest and say it, that you're going to kind of um, fault them for thinking that, just in the way that it's worded and how you say it is important. Um, so then the last part, so we've gone through the question. Um, the next part is how to persuade. And so really what we're doing when we're talking to somebody about suicide is we are persuading someone to stay alive. So um, we want to be able to listen to them, um, give them their full attention, and remember that suicide is not the problem. It's just a, sol a solution, a permanent so solution um, to this perceived problem. Um, that they don't think that they can get out of. And so to them, this is all that is ever going to be. And so, and it's very, very important to not rush into judgment, um, to really try and just be as open-minded as possible and allow um, the person talking to, to be um, open. And then just offering hope in any form, because even that a little bit of hope is probably more than that person had when you started that conversation. And then ask them, will you go with me to get help? Will you let me help you get help? Will you promise me not to kill yourself until we found help? And sometimes people are really resistant to, having help, to getting help. And so even a little bit um, of, you know, okay, then maybe tomorrow you'll make an appointment, but I'm going to check on you tomorrow. And just kind of that assurance from that person that they are not going to attempt or complete suicide that day is better than what it was when you started. So your willingness to listen and to help can really rekindle their hope because, again, they're probably feeling hopeless. They're probably feeling alone. They're probably feeling like nobody cares or nobody wants to hear about it or I don't want to tell you. And so that little bit was probably a lot for them. Um, and then the R is the refer. So suicidal people often believe that they can't be helped. Um, so you might have to kind of nudge them a little bit more. You might have to be the energy that they probably don't have because they probably have some depression. Um, and so they might not have a whole lot of energy. And so you might have to kind of bug them a little bit. Um, the best referral involves taking the person directly to someone who can help. And with our high school students, we tell them, like, bring them to, come with them to the guidance office to talk to somebody. Um, but if it's somebody that you know that's important in your life, um, Go with them if you need to. And maybe that's, that will be the motivation that they need to do it or the accountability to do it. Um, 
The next best referral is getting a commitment from them to accept it and then making arrangements. So maybe they'll accept the help and then maybe they call and make an appointment with you sitting right there. So maybe that's the, um, so that's the next best referral. And then the third best referral is to give them the information and try and get a good faith commitment not to complete or attempt suicide. Um, any willingness to accept help at some time, even if in the future is a good outcome. And so just remember, almost, since almost all efforts to persuade someone to live instead of attempt suicide will be met with agreement and relief, um, don't hesitate to get help, get involved, or take the lead. And so sometimes, sometimes there is resistance. And so that can be discouraging, but more often than not, um, people want, they just want somebody to be alongside them. Um, you can say, I want you to live. I am on your side, and we'll get through this. Um, the other thing is get other people involved. Because remember, they think they're alone. They don't think there's any hope. And so ask them, like, do you have any, like, who, who else do we have? Get more people involved, because then it's not just you either um, that's accountable to helping this person. Um, parents, brothers, sisters, pastor, um, anybody, really. Let's get, make a team to surround this person. Um, you can, people can join a team, um, offer to work with clergy, therapists, psychiatrists, um, anybody that's going to provide counseling or get treatment, and then follow up with this person. So maybe it's not somebody that you see all the time, but if you've had this, um, if you've made a referral to, for somebody to get help because you thought that they were feeling suicidal, just make sure that you follow up with them. Um, give them a phone call and, and whatever, whatever you're comfortable with to just kind of see if they got the help that they needed. And then um, just remember that when you plant the seeds of hope, hope helps prevent suicide. And I think it's important to remember that it's okay to not be okay. It's not okay to not get help. Um, we don't, you don't have to die for mental illness. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Okay, that's, uh, that's all of our questions. That's all of our time. So we got. <laughs> questions from the group? I've got, I've got the microphone so we can take some questions so that other people can hear. Um, while you're thinking about...